Just before we get into today's video, due to the nature of the topic, I think it's important to mention that if you struggle with suicidal thoughts, it's so easy to get in touch with the Samaritans either through their website or ringing 116123. Each and every person that's clicked on this video is an incredible and beautiful human, and I hope you're having a fantastic day. In the 21st century, we regard suicide through the lens of psychology and mental health, but in the Middle Ages, the medievals thought of it as one of the worst sins and treated those who had died by suicide as criminals. Let's travel back in time now and find out about Ares, discover what Diodans are, and why the Swiss dug up Mrs. Beringer and threw her into the Rhine. Ever since the dawn of time, and definitely in the medieval period, more powerful people, i.e. the ones with the money, have tried to enforce rules and restrictions on people who are lower down the social ladder. There have always been ways to get around what the Lord wants though, especially if you know someone who knows someone. And I know someone who's pretty good at helping you get access to the things that might land you in the stocks. Today's sponsor, Surfshark. None of us actually live in the Middle Ages, so you're probably familiar with what a VPN is. If you've somehow travelled forward a millennium, then we'll have to start right at the beginning, so get comfortable. We now have this thing called the Internet. It's like the biggest library that anyone can access, from the lowest serf to the mightiest lord. It's possibly a bit too accessible, which means you need to be protected. You could choose never to venture onto the Internet, and that's possibly wise for a medieval person. If, however, you want access to the entire spectrum of human knowledge, you're going to need protection. That's where Surfshark comes in. As a virtual private network, it's basically like wearing dark clothes at night to hide yourself as you go scrumping. By using Surfshark, you're hiding your identity whenever you go online, which means nobody's going to find out that you were the one stealing all the apples from his lordship. Surfshark also has the magical ability to make you travel all over the world in the blink of an eye. By changing your IP address, you can virtually travel to any other country in the world, and nobody can tell that you're still sat at home. This means you can get around the rules that would stop you from accessing certain information online that isn't available in your country, and skip merrily past all the censorship barriers. For us modern people, that means you can set your IP address to another country and get access to all the streaming libraries you could ever want. Or, if you're on holiday and really don't want to miss out on the latest episodes, you can change your location back and make sure you never miss out on any of your creature comforts. But my medieval friend, it doesn't stop there. Surfshark isn't like the town crier who'll share all your gossip with the local witch. They never track what you do online and make sure no one else tracks it either. So if our severely time-confused and panicked traveller wants to be safe, they clearly need to be using Surfshark like we currently are. You can use our code MADNESS in the description to get an extra three months free, plus you get a 30-day money-back guarantee when you try it out, so there's no risk involved. Anyway, now for today's episode. Welcome to Medieval Madness. The Airy Rolls During the 12th and 13th centuries, there were travelling courts across England. Small groups of justices were sent out to all of the counties from the central courts of Westminster. The counties were grouped into circuits known as Aries. Legal cases and lawsuits would have been heard at these mobile courts and presided over by the travelling judges. Among other things, Aries dealt with criminal offences, alongside this, any death that was thought to have occurred unnaturally was assigned to the king's coroner and a jury of men, local to the area in which the body was found. They were to report on who found the body, and whether the death was natural, accidental, by murder, or self-murder. If the deceased was murdered, whether the death was serious enough to warrant the execution of a liable living offender. If it was self-murder, was the crime committed when the deceased was responsible for their own actions? And finally, whether the deceased had any chattels and who was in charge of those goods at the present time. A Mortal Sin Medieval Christian theologians followed the teaching of Augustine of Hippo very closely when it came to the subject of suicide. Augustine believed that it should be viewed as a form of murder, which was forbidden in the Ten Commandments, a body of divine laws laid down by Moses in the Bible. Medieval Christianity connected the suicide of Judas, who hanged himself after his betrayal of Jesus, to the turning away from God of anyone who committed the act of killing themselves, one that was a mortal sin and could not be forgiven. This meant that from the 6th century, the Catholic Church refused to allow any person who had died by suicide any formal funeral rite. Burial in consecrated ground was also prohibited, and confiscation by royal authorities of the deceased goods along with the diodand, whether it belonged to the deceased or not. 
Diodans date back to the 11th century in English common law. They were an object fortified or given to God, a thing that was surrendered because it had caused a person's death. It might be an animal or an inanimate object, but if a coroner's jury decided that someone's personal property or chattel was responsible for the death of a human, or used in a suicide, then it was considered a diodand and a forfeit had to be paid. It could be a horse, or a piece of furniture, or even clothing. In theory, diodands were to be sold and then the profit was to be given to some worthy religious cause. If the owner could not pay the fine or diodand, the responsibility fell onto the townsfolk. In a case mentioned in the calendar of coroner's rolls of the City of London AD 1300-1378, a diodand was ordered to be paid in the sum of three pence by, quote, a shirt and beam by which a man committed suicide. It's not clear as to whether the shirt and beam were owned by the male victim or by someone else. Obviously, in the case of it being the latter, then someone else would have had to pay the fine, as the man was, of course, dead. Hidden Suicide in 1280, from the Isle of Somerset, we learn that William de Wedmore, vicar of Chiriton, hanged himself in his own home in the same village. The verdict was suicide. And Walter de Wedmore and John, his brothers, buried the said William without view of the coroner and took his chattels, value 34 shillings, so they were to be arrested. Afterwards, they came to court and the sheriff let them go. This record is typical of a person who has been judged to have deliberately killed themselves. It also demonstrates the attempts of his relatives to try and cover up the suicide so they can take his possessions, which should have been forfeited to the king, and bury their brother on consecrated ground. It was important to the medievals that they should be given a proper and decent burial, but suicides were deemed unfit for this special treatment. The suicide of a London woman in 1321 was found out by an ayah to be insane, nevertheless, her chattels were not given to her family. Instead, they were taken by the state under the authority of King Edward II as alms for her soul. This confiscation of the deceased wealth probably led many families to attempt to cover up evidence if there had been a suicide in their family. In 1256, one ayah in Northumberland heard the case of a young man named William, who was the son of Henry Lemur. William should have reported his mother's death as a suicide, but instead, quote, The jurors attest that William did not report the death when he found his mother hanging, but cut the wimple and took her down, took her to a bed, gave his neighbours to understand that she had died a natural death, and had her buried in the cemetery. Mrs. Lemieux's husband must have also conspired in the cover-up and none of the neighbours interfered, although at least one of them must have seen the body or known the truth because the two men, both father and son, were arrested for concealing a crime and the whole village was fined for not giving assistance during the inquiry. More complicated attempts at concealment were recorded in Devon in 1281 when a beadle named Henry was found hanged in Ottery St. Mary. The ayah there heard, quote, Henry's wife, Raghan Ildi, and Thomas Henry at once took Henry's body and put it in a bed and covered it. Later, they sent for one Henry de Cornubia, a chaplain, and gave him 30 shillings to conceal this felony. They executed Henry's will and later buried the body in Ottery St. Mary's Cemetery without a coroner's view. Henry's chattels were worth 60 shillings, meaning that the chaplain got 50% of the money. After hearing the evidence, the judges sent constables to arrest Raghan Ildi and her accomplice. Both of the accused denied murder and were able to convince the local jury of their innocence, so they were given a fine of six shillings and eight pence for burying a corpse before it had been examined by the coroner. The widow Rakanildi was ruined, not only had she lost her husband, but she had also lost a small fortune of four pounds, 17 shillings and tuppence, with the forfeit of her husband's 30 shilling legacy, the fine and the bribe. It wasn't just the church that condemned self-murder. Between the 11th and 13th centuries, the secular judicial system in many parts of Europe began to class suicide as an offence, usually because it deprived a feudal lord of his possession. In the same Devonshire Ayer, Henry was a wealthy villain who lived near the village of Bideford. He hanged himself in his own barn. Mysteriously, Henry's body ended up floating in the nearby river. Was it Henry's wife Agnes or Lord Richard that had cut him down and moved the body? As Henry's lord and following a natural death, it was Richard who would normally have inherited his chattels. As a suicide, though, the assets of 38 shillings and tuppence would be handed over to the king's treasury instead. Perhaps Agnes and Richard had conspired together to hide the crime. After being accused, Agnes demanded an inquest, denying the death and everything, and was found not guilty of murdering her husband or moving his body. Consequently, Richard also denied any involvement when he was arrested, and he too was acquitted by local jurors. Very superstitious. A French law in the town of Lille, which dates from around 1300, states that, quote, The body of a suicide is to be treated like that of a murderer, that is, if male dragged and hanged, if female burned under the gallows. 
This type of post-mortem torture of the body of a suicide stems from superstition and folklore and the idea of restless spirits walking the earth. But it was also meant to demonstrate how monstrous the idea of self-murder was to the Catholic Church and create an atmosphere of fear and disgust about suicide and deter any would-be self-murderers. Records from 1398 in Douai include a reference to wages paid to a hangman who, quote, at the gallows, a la justice, burned Marie Blasile, who had hanged and strangled herself in her house. Shortly before this, a woman hanged herself in jail and the magistrate had to ask the Council of Paris for instructions on what to do with the body. They were told to burn it, and this was done. In Germany, law stated that a suicide should be richly extracted from the house and burned in the fields, whatever the sex. In Nuremberg, during the 14th and 15th centuries, the burning was done either in open fields or at a crossroads. Back in France, the customs of Anneux and Maine recorded the practice of ritually obliterating the property of a suicide as well as destroying the corpse. Once someone was found guilty of the crime of suicide, the house should be pulled down or torn open on the side of the main road, the field should be burned, the vines cut and uprooted, and the woods fell to the height of a man. The Red Book of Abbeville recorded that in 1305, a clerk and merchant hanged himself in Amiens and his house was knocked down. In 1336, another man who died by suicide at saint riquier around Pentecost last also had his house razed. However, in England, the burning of houses was never really a thing. There, the treasury was usually the benefactor of any chattels left after a suicide, and the king liked his confiscations to remain in one piece. Supernatural beliefs over suicides extended to linking a human crime to a natural calamity. One of the main disasters that affected the medievals was crop failure, which was often caused by storms or high winds, and self-murder was thought to bring about this bad weather. This was often recorded in chronicles from Germany. One such record from Augsburg on St. Mark's Day, being Monday the 25th of April 1300, states that, quote, A wretch called the Strasimir died by hanging himself, and the same day came a thunderstorm and struck three women in the goat stall, vegetables rotted in the fields, and the same day a man drowned in the lake. So St. Mark's Day was appointed as a day of fasting so that God could protect us from suicide by hanging. Bad weather was also a cause for concern in Zurich, Switzerland in 1417, when the town council complained to the church that a priest who had killed himself had caused, quote, the dreadful weather that we had for so long because of his burial in consecrated ground of a man of this kind. In Basle, another Swiss city in 1439, Henry of Bernstein, a resident lawyer and diplomat, wrote that, quote, on the 4th of June, a respectable basil woman called Mrs. Berenger went off her head. Around midnight, got up from bed, got onto the roof, and jumped off to her death. She was buried at St. Leonard's, and it rained continuously for nearly a week, and people said it was because her body was in consecrated ground. So the Basel City Council decided that she'd be dug up and thrown into the Rhine. This decision taken, on the 9th of June, the rain let up a little. Then it began again, and continued for another day and a night. From reading the English Aya records, we can tell that hanging was the most common method of self-killing in both men and women in the Middle Ages, and that it was a high proportion of men died by suicide, just as it is today. In 2023, the most common method for female suicide is by self-poisoning. Strangely, there are no recorded cases of poisoning as a way of suicide in any medieval records. That's probably not because it never happened, but just because of the inability of the medieval coroner to detect it. Thank you for watching this episode. Don't forget to visit the link in the description and use the code MADNESS to get an extra three months free. Hope you have a great week and I'll see you next episode. Cheers.